This little video is not a how-to video, it's merely a few thoughts and uh, concepts that um, some of you would be uh, armchair engineers might like to think on. Anyway, recently, I, uh, before Christmas, I, I took a look at some of the work that, especially in the States, that hand engravers are doing, um, hunting scenes on firearms and this type, type of thing. Um, we have a tradition in this country of um, fine engraving also. The Birmingham gun houses are renowned for that. And uh, I'd often thought I'd like to try that. Um, due to my age now, I no longer have the dexterity, I no longer have the eyesight. But I thought I'd just like to sort of try it. I do have a pantograph engraver, but uh, I thought I'd try the freehand style. So I looked on YouTube to see what I could find. There's an awful lot out there. And then I decided, well, it appears that um, a popular form of uh, assistance is uh, a pulsating air engraver, which is nothing more than um, uh, oscillating pressure of air acting on a small uh, piston in the graver body that strikes the end of the anvil or the end of the graver. And uh, I looked at a few uh, vibrating types, buzzer types. Uh, I thought the air seemed to be the idea, something on a, a miniature jackhammer. So I looked for something that, um, homemade, you know, just as a try me handed. And there's nothing out there. I've had a look, and there's a few people made their own, but there's no mechanics or physics uh, description or anything involved, um, which surprised me. And perhaps I'm looking in the wrong places. Anyway, I decided to have a little play myself, and uh, I soon found out that uh, this pulsating air has got nothing to do with the pressure or amplitude but it's more to do with the frequency of the pulses and the mass of the piston in the engraver. Anyway, I've made up a simple little uh, pump. It's not really a pump because there's no valves, but it's a little sewing machine motor and glued to a piece of wood. There's a piece of acrylic which I've drilled here. There's a piece of a 5 16 rod. And at this end there's a little groove and I put an O-ring, more about that O-ring in a minute. And then this we've got something like, I don't know, three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch crank. And it's pivoted at this end. And we have some cross drilled and a hose coming out this end. This is just temporary. To allow this to oscillate. But... Uh, these O-rings, I've got a, a box of O-rings, I think there's 7,000 in the box, ranging from 1 8 up to an inch and a half, made in China. I think we'll leave it there, shall we? They didn't last two blinky minutes. So that's a second-hand one that came out of a pressure washer, and that's hung up quite well. Um, I've connected this up to a light dimmer switch, and you can see it's just simply a piston going up and down. Um, I can control the speed of this through the dimmer. You can get the idea. I'll just turn that off so you can hear me better. This is necessary to be rubber in order for it to oscillate. But there's a certain amount of that in the walls of it, and, and there's energy lost here. Anyway, the point I'm trying to. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. I got called away. Where was I? Uh, efficiency. Pulsating air. Yes. Um, I've already said, and I wish to push this point very firmly, for maximum efficiency of these air engravers, there's a sort of a, a resonant narrow peak where they go from working good to working absolutely superb. 
The smallest variation in piston mass or speed of the uh, pulses um, will make a dramatic effect on the efficiency of it. Um, as I say, it's a very narrow band of resonance where, and I'm repeating myself, it goes from, from good to absolutely superb. The difference is, instead of just a curl going ahead of the tool, it's almost like a, a machine gun blast, very fast chips flying away. But uh, that peak of efficiency is a very narrow band. And that's the point I put across and why I made this variable. Anyway, I had a go at this before Christmas, over which period I was taken quite ill. And so this has got shelved. I might come back to it at a later date. But for those who wish to pursue their own, I've, uh, I've described the path I think you ought to take is to aim for that peak of efficiency um, and uh, your rewards will be in that direction. Anyway, it's something for you to think of. This is just one uh, uh, small idea I wish to convey. Okay, I'm going to move on if I may. I don't profess to be organised um, at all. But I have my way of working and, and there's some people that uh, are so organised and so professional. You, well, you just have to admire them, don't you? And then you get the other end of the scale. I went to a, a guy not too long ago, picked up an outboard, one well, of the remains of an outboard. And it was in his garage and he'd taken it apart and he hadn't got all the parts and he'd lost this and it was all junk all over the work floor. Oh, here is a bit of that. That belongs to it. The, the food nuts here. The... Anyway, oh, if I come across this, I'll let you have it. And anyway, this went on for weeks, and I thought, how on earth? Anyway, it ended up lots of nuts and bolts and bits and pieces were missing on this, which doesn't really surprise me. Anyway, it brings me on to this next little uh, concept of an idea, if you like. When I take something apart, it doesn't matter what it is, it can be a lawnmower engine, it can be a sewing machine, it can be a tape recorder, whatever, whatever I'm working on. You start off and you, 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 you take the case apart and you've got some screws or bolts or whatever, clips. Well, you can put them in a tin lid and they usually get knocked and get spilt and then you lose some and now we've got to get a bit more organised than that. I quite like jars. Um, a, they're free and you can see what's in them. And it keeps things together. So when you've taken the case off and you've taken the nuts and bolts off and you've opened it, so you put them in the jar and you know where they are, no problem. And then you proceed to take things further and, and, and um, get further into the innards of the thing. So you take off more springs and more clips and little doodars. So you want to put them in a jar. So you put them in a jar. And then you proceed to carry on like this and, and you eventually get into the middle of the thing putting all your bits and pieces away in order. You can see basically what I've got here. It's nothing more than a curved back shelf, carousel if you like, that your parts are stored in. And if you think about it as a, a logical sequence of progression as you take things apart so when you come to put them together well the last things that uh, the last nuts and bolts you took out are the ones that you just put there so you put them all back and then we come to these so you fit them you fit them back and so we go back to the beginning where eventually come the first nuts and bolts that we took the case apart. I haven't put any in here, but use your imagination, right? So this is a very simple uh, carousel, if you like. It's just a curved back. So as jars or whatever they might be get pushed on, it comes round to the fore. 
Now this concept was used very early on in supermarkets and uh, the idea behind it was that the staff loading up fresh stock onto the shelves brought the old stock from the back up to the fore. Well this is fine uh, till customers realise that the packet or the bottle or the jar or whatever it was I had in the hand um, was an older date than the one they could see previously so they ended up taking stock from the back of the shelves and that takes place today but leaving that apart this simple progression is I mean it's hardly you're probably wondering why I'm even mentioning it but there's quite a bit of potential here if you want to take that to another level I'll leave you to think on that one